Even though defining normal strain is very helpful to with it, define properties like elastic modulus, and even helpful for calculating deformations experimentally with the help of, for example, strain gauges, it is advantageous to develop expressions for the deformations of each of the main types of stresses, as it was mentioned two main videos ago. Furthermore, variations of these deformation expressions that we develop for each stress type, but in the form of strain energy, will be helpful to calculate overall deformations with the help of Castigliano's theorem. But that's not always part of a mechanics of materials course. Link below if you're interested though. From the normal stress and axial loading video, link below, we know that normal strain is defined as the deformation delta over the initial length L. And we know that the elastic modulus is the ratio between the stress and the strain within the elastic or linear section of the stress strain diagram. Since the average normal stress is defined as the load over the area, and remember that those two are perpendicular, then by substituting normal strain, we find that the elastic modulus is equal to PL over A delta. Solving for delta, the deformation we're looking for, we get the expression for axial deformation delta. The evaluation of any axial deformation using this expression is pretty straightforward, as long as you know how to identify the cross-section area and the internal forces for each section. But what's usually not explained properly in lectures and textbooks is the use of indices to identify the displacement of one point with respect to the other. This is essential to correctly calculate deformations, or as we will see in the next main video, link below, solve statically indeterminate problems. The first sub-index of delta refers to the point you're calculating the displacement of, and the second sub-index refers to the point you are using as a point of reference. So for example, for a cantilever rod AB that is being compressed against the wall, it makes sense to have the wall be the reference, and the actual moving side of the rod, the free end B, be the point you're calculating the displacement of. But you can also calculate the displacement of the wall with respect to the free end. And you'll see with this video's example and the example videos linked below, how this is sometimes advantageous. One very important difference to point out here is the sign of the overall deformation versus the sign of the displacement. If all we want to calculate is the compression or extension of a member due to axial loading, the sign of the load has to correspond to the compression or tension, meaning delta is negative if P is negative or a compressive force, and a positive delta for a positive or tensile load. On the other hand, the displacement of one point with respect to the other will follow the direction of the force affecting the point. So for example, the free end will be moving towards the wall, the left, or the negative x direction, however you want to look at it. Since the force FBA is already negative, that is the force from B to A, which is in the negative x-axis direction, delta BA will be negative as well, just like force BA. Notice that the length, area, and elastic modulus are always positive, so the displacement direction will always be determined by the force in this case the force that affects B, which is following the same index convention we used in the axial loading video before, from B to A. If our frame of reference is instead the free end B, the reaction force at the wall that is compressing rod AB in the direction from A to B is causing a deflection delta AB, that is moving point A with respect to the point of reference B in the positive x-axis. And again, since the force AB is positive, delta AB will also be positive. To sum these up, we have a negative displacement of B with respect to A, a positive displacement of A with respect to B, and in this case, a negative overall delta, since the internal load within AB is a compressive and therefore negative load. For multi-section members, you can use the subscripts to calculate the overall displacement of one side with respect to the other, so for example, for a rod A, B, C, D subjected to different loads, the displacement of D with respect to A is equal to delta DC plus delta CB plus delta BA. Now, in this case, since there's a force somewhere between A and B, let's call it point M, the internal force in sections AM and MB are gonna be different, making the variables within the expression of delta BM and those of the expression delta MA not the same. 
And again, you'll see how this is useful with the examples we'll go over in this and the linked videos below. Now, of course, these deformations can be caused by more than just external loads. One parameter that can cause considerable deformations in axially loaded members is temperature. The coefficient of thermal expansion, alpha, is a material property that when multiplied by the change in temperature and the length of the member yields the elongation or compression delta of the member. If the change in temperature is positive, it means that the member is heating up and therefore delta is a positive deformation due to thermal expansion. The member gets cold, delta T is negative, and therefore the deformation is also negative. The total deformation of a member will be the result of adding both deformations from thermal expansion and regular external axial loads with their respective directions and signs, of course. Problems with temperature changes are usually statically indeterminate problems, which we will cover in the next main video, link below. So make sure to check that one out for problems that make full use of the concepts of thermal expansion. For now, all we need to know is that the expression alpha times delta T times L allows us to calculate the deformation delta and that this deformation can be added together to the regular axial deformation PL over AE. Now, every time a geometry is elongated or compressed in one axis, the other axes will shrink or expand respectively, usually. This behavior is only true for Poisson's ratio values between 0 and 0 0.5 but we'll get to that in a minute. The Poisson's ratio, Greek letter nu, is defined as the negative value of lateral strain over axial strain. Therefore, for a member that is being strained along the x-axis, nu would be equal to minus epsilon y over epsilon x. And for that third axis coming out and into the screen, minus epsilon z over epsilon x. For radial coordinates, this definition can also be used so nu can also be defined as minus epsilon r over epsilon x. Oxetic materials have a negative Poisson's ratio. This means that when an axis is stretched, the other two expand, and when the axis is compressed, the other two shrink. This is similar to how the Hubbermann sphere toy behaves, but this is of course a bit of an unusual behavior. For this reason, Poisson's ratio values of traditional engineering materials will be positive. And since the volumetric strain is the sum of the strains in all orthogonal directions, if Poisson's ratio was larger than 0.5, then by substituting the strain in y and the strain in z in terms of the strain in x, we'd easily see that the volumetric strain would be negative. This would mean that a structure that is being compressed would have its volume expand, and that a structure that is being subjected to tension would have its volume shrink. And that just doesn't make sense. So for this reason, Poisson's ratio will usually have values between 0 and 0 0.5. As mentioned in the previous video, the relationship between the shear modulus G and the elastic modulus E is related to Poisson's ratio as well. This is a useful expression when only one of the elastic properties and Poisson's ratio are known, or when both elastic properties are known and we are trying to find the Poisson's ratio itself. Let's look at a simple example where we make use of what we've learned here. A two section 600 millimeter long rod, 20 millimeters and 15 millimeters in diameter, that has an elastic modulus of 99.5 gigapascals is subjected to the axial loads shown in the figure. If the diameter of section AB shrinks by 1.6 microns, what is the Poisson's ratio and the shear modulus of the material, and what's the change of diameter of section BC? Additionally, what is the displacement of the free end at C? Before watching the solutions to these questions, I would recommend you to pause the video and try solving it yourself. The first question refers to the Poisson's ratio, which we know is the negative of the lateral strain over the axial strain. The lateral strain, epsilon y, epsilon z, or in this case, epsilon d, referring to the diameter. The diametral strain would be equal to the deformation over the original dimension, both in meters, and for the axial strain of that same section AB, we'd need to find the deformation delta first. To find the internal force P that we would use for this expression, we draw a free body diagram of a cut anywhere between A and B to find that internal force, and since we don't have the reaction force at the wall A, we'll use the geometry from C to the cut. This shows us that the internal load P 
which we always assume in the direction of a tensile force so that positive is tension and negative is compression, just like the convention, is equal to positive 10 kilonewtons. Substituting the values, we find that delta is 128 microns, and with that value, we can calculate the axial strain. With both the lateral and the axial strains, we find a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.25. For the shear modulus g, we can use the expression we mentioned right before the example, which depends on the Poisson's ratio we just calculated. To find the change in diameter of section BC, we need the strain and the original dimension. The lateral strain we can find if we have Poisson's ratio and the axial strain. And the axial strain we can calculate if we first calculate the axial deformation of member BC. A free body diagram at a cut between B and C would reveal an internal load P equal to 16 kN, which with the other dimensions of BC allows us to find delta, the axial strain, the lateral or diametral strain, and finally the change in diameter. Finally, if we want the displacement of C, we probably want that with respect to a surface that is not moving, in this case the wall A. Delta CA would be equal to delta CB plus delta BA, and these displacements we already found. 182 microns for delta CB, since BC is elongating because of the positive value of delta in purple, which means that C is moving away from B in the positive x-axis, and from before, delta BA is equal to positive 128 microns, again because section AB is elongating because of the positive value of the overall delta in orange. This means that B, with respect to the wall A, is moving in the positive x direction. This means that C, with respect to the wall A, is being displaced 310 microns in the positive x direction. For a temperature change related problem, as well as more examples related to axial deformation and Poisson's ratio, make sure to check out the additional example videos linked in this video's description. Thanks for watching.